You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this podcast series. Today's conversation will focus on the critical economic relationship between the United States and our friendly neighbors to the North, Canada. We'll also talk about some of the key differences between the two countries and some of the steps that can be taken to make our partnership even stronger. And I'm very pleased to have joining me today, Dr. Susan Black, the President and CEO of the Conference Board of Canada. Welcome, Susan. Well, good morning, Steve. I'm delighted to be here today. Talk about your expertise in Canada and also the role of the Conference Board of Canada. Well, I'm happy to do that. But if you'd allow me, Steve, we have a tradition in Canada that whenever we're speaking publicly, we always acknowledge the traditional lands we're coming from. So if you'll allow me, I I would like to share that land acknowledgement. So I'm coming to you today from Toronto. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. And given that this podcast is going to be heard in Canada and the United States, I'd also like to take the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge all of the nations across Turtle Island. Now, you ask, tell us about your expertise in Canada and the role of the conference board, and I'm always delighted to do that. So we are one of Canada's largest independent research organizations. We've been around for almost 70 years, and our focus is on nine specific knowledge areas. And I uh, I won't list them all for you, but I will I'll share that the ones were probably the largest ones, the ones we're best known for would be Canadian economics, education and skills, human resources, and, and probably Indigenous and Northern communities. The work, the research we do falls into two buckets. So we provide a lot of fundamental data and research insights that are used by leaders across the country when they make Uh, basic decisions. So for example, our economic forecasts are used by all the provincial finance ministers to estimate equalization payments across the country. The other bucket of research we do, we call our wicked problem research. And that's where we tackle issues that are complex, uh, that don't have any obvious solutions, that have big policy implications for large parts of the population. So a couple of examples of that kind of research recently would be around bringing value-based healthcare to Canada, Uh, articulating the best career paths for uh, our our, our citizens and Indigenous, our Indigenous citizens and uh, folks in our Northern communities. Uh, We've done work on women on boards and how to increase the representation there. So quite a wide variety of, of issues that, you know, not easy to find those right answers. Our goal is to help leaders make better decisions. We produce about 500 research reports a year. And like you, Steve, we've got executive councils. We have 16 of them. So in a nutshell, um, that's who we are. And that's the expertise we hope to bring to Canada's leaders. Yeah, and the, and, and the conference board plays an incredible role in Canada. So you know, let's shift now to talk about uh, uh, the US and Canada. Clearly, we are sister countries. Um, but have developed very differently from post-colonial times. Give us a little history lesson uh, from a Canadian perspective on on how uh, the two countries have developed differently. Well, you're right, Steve. We do share many similarities, but there are significant differences. And I would attribute them to to things that have happened in our respective histories and to different, I'm going to call them structural features, uh, particularly around geography and population size. So let me touch on each of those really quickly. Uh, Both our countries were settled by Europeans, right? So the British came over, the French came over, they settled us. But at a very early stage, we took different paths. So the the United States, you guys had a revolutionary war in 1776. And out of that birthed the Republic and a a whole um, political system based on, uh, I would say based on, um, and based on a Republic democracy, if you will. We decided to remain uh, as part of the British Commonwealth. And we are to this day, a constitutional monarchy. So going back to those early events, you get different political systems, both democratic, but different. 
you have um, a constitution that sets out many principles, many rights to freedom of expression, expression and so on, but also seems to have embedded in it a lot um, of rights around individuals. We have a charter of freedoms, uh, rights and freedoms that really focuses more around the collective. So, so right there, you've got a difference in terms of where the orientation is. The second thing I would say is our geographies are very different. So we're both very large countries, uh, big land masses and water masses. Uh, if you look at the United States, you've got, uh, you're again, early in your history, a country that everybody came to and you settled. You went right across the country and uh, there's such wonderful and rich history around settling the West and getting to California. We have a big country, um, but I can tell you, no one was hooking up wagon trains to uh, conquer the tundra. And no one was planting corn or soybeans on the Canadian shield or north of the tree line. Uh, and why is that? It is a really cold, cold country. In fact, there's something like 90% of the Canadian population lives within 100, 150 miles of the US border. Um, so our focus here very much has always been on how do you survive that? And you survive that by cooperating. So there's a collective mentality, again, that I think emerges from just being simply in different geographies. And the third thing I would point to is we have different, different histories and different ideas about immigration. So in the, U, in the United States, uh, we get the phrase, you're a melting pot. People come, they come through Ellis Island, you come to embrace the ideal of what it means to be in, in America and be an American. We don't have a melting pot mindset. We call it a mosaic. And we're very clear and very uh, devoted to promoting multiculturalism. You know, what that means is when people come, they bring their cultures and we don't ask them to assimilate to, to a single ideal. Uh, we, we encourage people to come um, and we are always seeking ways to make it easier for them to arrive. I, you know, for this podcast, I looked up some uh, immigration stats because I was curious about this and I understand about a million people came into the, U the United States last year, which is about 0.3% of the population. Even though we are a much smaller country, we had 400,000 people come, and uh, which is about 1% of the population. If you compare our countries, 45% of Canadians belong to the second generation of immigrants. I'm one of those people. Only 13% of United States citizens were born outside the country. So that just creates really different dynamics in terms of how you handle things like immigration and diversity and inclusion and so on. And we have a very big focus on that. So as to sum this up, I would say the United States more individualistic. We place a, a bigger premium on sort of the collective good, if you will, that does show up in our choices. We have national health care. Majority of the universities are publicly funded. Our banking system very highly regulated, which stood the country well in 2008. The other thing I would say coming out of the culture is, and I'm going to be very polite about this, um, we're more collaborative and say consensus oriented, and some people would say polite, and I would say our American colleagues perhaps are more assertive. I'll put it that way. What are you talking about? <laughs> As I as I cautioned you, I'm trying to be polite here. But you listen, <laughs> hey, we I know that you were educated and went to, at, at, in the U.S. and spent a lot of time uh, in undergrad and grad school here, so you know what it's all about for sure. I do, and I I love it, and I welcome it. And you were going to talk a little bit about how deeply intertwined our countries are. So I think well, it's good to understand our respective cultural differences because we bring them to bear in conversations and decisions. Yeah, and I think that this is this is a really critical point, Susan, because a lot of people in the United States just sort of view Canada as, well, it's just another state, not, not meaning that they're part of the United States, but they're just like us, you know, same language, drive the same cars, drive on the same side of the road, you know, it's, it, it, it looks the same. And when you travel in Canada, it feels the same, but it's not the same. And I think that's your point. It's not the same from historical perspective, from a cultural perspective, and from an economic perspective. And that's an important thing for, for, um, for Americans to, to understand as, you know, as we contemplate this great friendship between the two nations, right? Yeah, it's so true. We, yes, we share, we share a belief in democracy and the basic freedoms. We share a language, but Canadians approach policy differently. And we do have a different view on what uh, we aspire to for our societies. And I think it's, it's, to be, have a really close friendship and, and a great relationship, it's always helpful to remember where the other party is coming from. 
Yeah, and you know, it, it, this whole notion of a mosaic is, is really interesting um, because you know, people in America say, well, well, why do you have two different languages? And, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got a, a certain portion of the country that is French speaking and so forth. And all the, you know, everything is done in both ways. You've got this enormous indigenous population and Canadians really celebrate that, don't they? The differences and, and, and the coexistence. It's, so it's a, it's a different attitude. Oh, very much so. And I think it makes our country richer. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, but still we are the biggest, the two countries are the largest trading partners of, of each other. We share this long, common, peaceful border. We, and, and, and we have been allies in, in virtually, you know, everything that has happened geopolitically since the founding of the countries. That is so true. And I think the degree to which both our countries can prosper in the future will depend on some, to some part on how much we can continue that alignment and we can enrich each other. You know, when you get beyond the cultural and, and you get to geopolitics, you know, there are differences and there are similarities in views. Obviously, we're both part of key parts of NATO and, and uh, the military alliance. But but just in terms of how we see the world, you just describe what you can about, um, you know, what you see as the as the similarities and differences. Well, I think in terms of, let's talk about trade, because I think trade is a really important uh, aspect of how we interact with each other. So we are deeply intertwined as, as trading partners, right? And, and you know this more than anyone with the work that you do at the conference board. But if you look at Canada and the US and Mexico, frankly, we produce industrial machinery, transportation equipment, produce a lot of goods together. We trade services and workers together. And increasingly, we're going to be involved and cooperating. We're going to need to cooperate around digital trade. So uh, there's always a tension between wanting to protect what's good for your own country versus looking um, versus seeing how can we enhance what's good for our own country by cooperating more. And I think we've got opportunities right now to enhance the trade between the two countries, which is so deeply, deeply um, important to each of us. Yeah, we've talked about some of the similarities between Canada and the United States and how the development of the two nations has evolved over the years. Next, we're going to get into a, a deeper conversation about trade between the two countries and an opportunity to strengthen this important partnership. We'll take a short break and be right back with more of my conversation with Dr. Susan Black. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain, and what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by the President and CEO of the Conference Board of Canada, Dr. Susan Black. So Susan, we were just talking before the break about trade and, and the importance of trade. And you mentioned um, you know, the North American uh, block you know with Canada as well you know some share some facts and figures on on trade you know north and south here um, you know within the block and and how do our countries interact I think people are always surprised by the facts and figures because Canada population wise is such a small country exports to Canada from the U.S. it's actually 18 percent of total United States exports go to Canada and that is more Steve than the exports that go to China, Japan, and the UK combined, and it's growing. So in 2019, exports from the United States to Canada were $293 billion, and that's up 43% from a decade earlier. Um, similar growth pattern around trade, uh, excuse me, services exports. So $68 billion a couple of years ago, again, up 56% since 2009. If I look at it from the Canadian side, you are our biggest market. Exports to the U.S. account for 75% of Canada's overall exports in 2019. So we are in incredibly intertwined. And so that goes back to what I said about, it, I think it behooves both of our countries 
to spend time thinking about what is good for us as a, as a collective, as a block, as opposed to, and to balance those tensions against what's, what's good for um, us individually. I think in the long run, we, we would increase our prosperity if we looked at that. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, historically, you've seen, you know, great uh, interaction between the United States and Canada in the auto industry. You mm -hmm. know, I don't know that, that most Americans know that, uh, that many of the autos that, uh, that, that are supposed, you know, quote unquote, U.S. Uh, nameplates are really made in Canada. And, um, you know, vice versa, the, the natural resource trade from Canada to the United States to support the manufacturing is incredible. But there have been some tension points, you know, around, and you know, especially around uh, things like, you know, softwood lumber and, and some of those um, goods. Talk about some of the tension points and, and, you know, why? Why do we have any tension points? Well, I think there are forces in both countries that are more protectionist than I would, uh, than I would like them to be. So you know, in the U.S. right now, we hear the phrase buy American. Fair enough. But I would argue that I think we'd all be better off if it was buy North American, if we enhanced our bilateral trade. Uh, we've got to move away from these protectionist policies. And I'm not uh, just poking fingers at the, uh, the U.S. government. In Canada, we have protectionist policies, which I would argue we should take another look at. You know, we've got supply management around dairy, poultry, eggs, and so on. There have been tensions for years and decades between the two countries around softwood lumber. Uh, so I think it starts with having a government that um, offers a stable political and trade environment and, again, can look collectively at what makes sense for North America as a, as a block, if you will. Clearly, the rest of the world is aligning around blocks. So I think it would behoove us to, to go back to those days where we really, you know, the NAFTA days where we really did look um, at what made sense and you know, help both countries reduce the, you know, the, the tariffs that are a consequence. Uh, tariffs is not the right word. It would help us both if we took a hard look at the cost of protectionism and did what we could to reduce that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Susan. And I think, you know, both countries have become over-reliant on supply chains that begin in Asia, and uh, especially China. A lot of manufacturing from both countries has gone that way. And I think recently we've learned how volatile those supply chains and how fragile those supply chains are, you know, particularly during the pandemic when, you know, you had shutdowns and disruptions and everything. And and, you know, you look to the beginnings of NAFTA and, in, and, and Mexico is a critical part of NAFTA here. You know, the reason that we moved the supply chains over was for labor arbitrage. It was cheaper to produce it elsewhere and then ship it across the ocean. But that's not good for sustainability, for carbon output as we're burning all that fuel back and forth. Uh, labor has become more expensive. There are geopolitical tensions between North America and, uh, and China, especially. So, you know, I, I think you're right. And I think, I think the leaders of both countries need to come back to uh, a NAFTA orientation. I think it's interesting and symbolic that NAFTA, the name of the last agreement, in all three countries, we use that same name. Today, in each country, it's a different name. And to me, it may seem trite, but I think that's a subtle symbolic a symbol of the fact that you know, we're not all that aligned and we've got to move towards that. You know, China is a big security risk for both of our nations as well as other parts of the world. And the degree to which we can we can be aligned on the particularly the areas of growth around trade, uh, we're gonna, we're all, we will all be in a stronger security position. And yes, you're right about supply chains. Your organization and my organization have done a lot of work there. And I'm not suggesting we should reduce globalization, but let's look at how within a North American context, we can strengthen those supply chains. Look at Canada and see, I would offer, I would ask American companies, look at Canada, see what you can put here, see what kind of direct investment you can make. We've got a lot of, we've got resources, we've got tremendous labor markets, and we need to encourage it. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it, you, you mentioned that the relative sizes of the countries, 10% of, uh, of the population, uh, Canada is 10% uh, of the population of of, of the U.S. And, but the, res the natural resources are incredible you know, one of the key uh, long-term issues for both of our countries and, and all of North America, maybe the world, is energy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we have been both, both countries have been a hydrocarbon-based 
uh, um, energy. I think that uh, Canada has done a better job with with some areas like hydro uh, and so forth. But but uh, talk about uh, what you know about Canada's long term sustainable energy plans. You know where where are we going? Are, you know are you is it is it simply just uh, you know convert to 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 wind and solar or you know do you see that um, moving more towards uh, towards nuclear as well? Well, I would, I would like to say we see ICS moving more towards nuclear. Uh, like all developed countries, we're deeply concerned about it. We have targets like everybody else does. It's not going to be easy to meet those targets. There's a lot of tension around things like carbon capture, capture carbon taxes. If you look at topics like uh, how do we create circular economy around plastics, we're at the very early stages of trying to figure that out. And what is becoming very apparent is you want to create a circular economy there, which you know, drives sustainability. Uh, it's complex. You have to shift an entire ecosystem. So I would say that across our provinces and our federal government with our major corporations, everybody's thinking and talking about what can we do in our part of the world to increase uh, sustainability and reduce our reliance on uh, carbon and, and reduce our, our, G, our greenhouse gas emissions, it is an incredibly complex problem right now. You have a lot of actors with different political agendas moving in a very different way. Yeah, and, it, and this is the case across the world. And the Paris Accords were, were an attempt, and I think Canada um, enthusiastically endorsed it. I think the U.S. was a little more skeptical um, mostly not not from an objective perspective, but mostly from you know not not wanting to damage um, damage the economy by doing it. But but clearly this is a global issue for us, and I think this is a place that, that you know the two countries could work together and and really provide some leadership for the rest of the world. What do you think? I absolutely think that, and I think our systems are aligned now as it is, or at least they're positioned so they could be even more aligned. Uh, Canada is one of the top uh, clean tech innovators in the world, and 80% of our clean tech exports actually designed for the U.S. So uh, Canadian solutions can help both countries navigate um, how to mitigate uh, emissions. Other things that we talk about and we're looking at here are how do how do we generate and distribute electricity in, in an ever more efficient fashion? You know, like electricity is a big export from Canada to the U.S. Uh, we need uh, policies. I think we need increased policies around industrial emissions. We need policies around landfill and so on. Everything is very intertwined. So the more that we can have policy frameworks that make sense in both areas, and the better off we are. Um, I do note that uh, Jennifer Granholm, who is your U.S. the U.S. Energy Secretary, did in a it was a recent interview, I believe, did acknowledge that. Uh, the role Canada could play in helping um, the United States transition to clean energy. I think she said it's, we, can't, we can't tackle climate crisis alone. And that, that's so true for all of us, uh, bilateral cooperation. The point about how intertwined we are is really, really important. And I'm not sure that people in, in, in each country really understand that. It, but it does drive the, the need for mutual defense, but also mutual planning, as you're saying, and strategic planning. And, and, and that's something that I think has, has eroded you know, in, in, in the political cycles here over the past decade, at least, and, and needs to come back because you know, there, there's no reason why both countries need to plan everything independently. You know, we are, you know, we're such close siblings that, that if, if, we could, if we could harness the power of both countries together and plan together, we would be much better off. Clearly, there's a lot of work to be done to decarbonize the environment for both our countries, but that's been a long-standing issue. It's just becoming more and more prominent. I would say where we've got real opportunities around planning is our, around the approaches to digital trade, which is becoming an ever-increasing part of trade. You know, if we're going to really benefit from all the technology innovations, things like blockchain and you know, the boom in e-commerce, we need trade to move seamlessly across borders. Um, and there are clauses in the you know, CUSMA, as we call it, the trade agreement. But I don't think we've got policy frameworks that are, that are similar, that are designed to do that. And I think to get those policy frameworks, is a, that's a place where government at the highest levels needs to start paying a lot more attention and working on it now. 
uh, it takes trust. And the good thing I think about being in a relationship for hundreds of years and having such uh, deeply intertwined economies is we do have a basis of trust, notwithstanding some some incidents from time to time or regimes from time to time that don't give Canadians confidence. We'll leave that aside. But I think we have a basis to start from, and I think we could lead the world in being uh, this sort of the stewards of digital trade, if you will, or promoters of digital trade. But we need policy frameworks that make sense. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, at, at the core of it, we live in the same neighborhood and and neither one of us is going to move. <laughs> so, you know, it it uh, it, it really does. Uh, it, it really does underscore the need and the opportunity to 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 do better planning together and and to be better allies, I think, yeah. better neighbors. Well, and I think and, I know and to take advantage of these emerging issues. Um, and emerging technologies. electric vehicles is a is a classic example, too. So, yeah. President Biden has a goal, electric vehicles making up half of auto sales by 2030, which is like just around the corner. Canada is home to critical, a uh, lot of critical minerals that are required for building those vehicles, so nickel and lithium and so on. So let's focus on that. Let's focus on how we can replicate the, the success of the auto pack so many years ago, which really helped both our countries prosper. Yeah, really great points. Uh... Dr. Susan Black, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, it was my pleasure. And if I can leave you with one thought, we are students at the Conference Board of the Canada-United States Relationship. And in, in reflecting on that, we came across a quote from JFK. And although it was 60 years ago, I do think it still holds today. So let me share it with you. And here's what JFK said in 1961. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends and necessity has made us allies. Those whom nature hath so joined together, let no man put asunder. And it really is one of my favorite quotes about the relationships we share. So thank you, Steve. I'm so um, delighted to have been able to chat with you today. Yeah, thank you, Susan. And thanks to all of you for listening to CEO Perspectives. Every few weeks, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover the leading topics in economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues. Please send it to every Canadian citizen. I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.